afternoon. So I arranged for cooler weather because I knew you were <laughs> uncomfortable here. So um, don't say we never do anything for you. All right, today, uh, well, before we start, there's the last and second and last extra credit assignments up. So they're both on CourseWorks now. They're due in May. Um, today we are going to do some really unusual virology. We're going to talk about things that don't fit anywhere else and which break a lot of the rules uh, that we've talked about, unusual agents. The first one is called a virophage. This is a entity that came out a couple of years ago, a few papers on these already. The first one was called Sputnik and this was a virus that replicates only in amoeba that have been already infected with Mimi virus. So you may, may remember Mimi viruses are these very large DNA containing viruses. They have the biggest viral genomes that we know about, 1.2 million bases. And Sputnik is a virus that will only replicate in cells infected with Mimi viruses. So they were called virophages by the first investigators who discovered them. And that word means virus eater. Phage means to eat. Bacteriophage was originally coined because the agent looked like it was eating the bacteria. So now we have a virophage. And not only is, uh, does the re replication of this Sputnik require Mimi virus, but it actually interferes with Mimi virus replication as well. It reduces the yield of Mimi, Mimi viruses by about 70%. Personally, I don't like the word virophage. As you will see, this is something we've, this is an, an activity we've known about for many, many years. And so there's no, it really makes no sense to call it something that's eating another virus. So here are some photographs of um, cells co-infected with uh, Mimi virus and Sputnik. So here's an infected cell. Here are some Mimi virus particles. They're very big, if you remember. See them here. Within the amoeba, the Mimi virus sets up what's called a, f a viral factory, which is this very large, darkly staining entity, Mimi virus viral factory. And there the virus is replicating its genome and assembling particles. It's doing everything in this factory. And you can see within the factory, this is a cell co-infected with Mimi and Sputnik. Th there are little Sputnik viruses replicating in the factory. So Sputnik is much smaller. It's physically smaller and its genome is much smaller. And in, typically, they replicate within the factory. Now, um, so they depend on Mimi virus to provide function. So these are obviously viruses that lack genes that they need for replication. The uh, Sputnik interferes with Mimi virus. Uh, you can see it causes very strange particles to be made, like this one. So this is a normal Mimi particle. And this one, you can see, is completely broken. Uh, many of them have these multiple layers of uh, proteins on the surface like this one. This was the normal Mimi virion would look like. And you can see this aberrant uh, layer. It probably has something to do with an altered morphology induced by uh, the Sputnik. And in some cases, the Sputnik is actually encapsulated into Mimi virus. So here's a Mimi virus particle. And the inside appears to contain Sputnik particles. So apparently as these form in the factory that encapsulates Sputnik. So you can see. These could explain why these um, Sputniks interfere with um, Mimi virus replication. This not the only, Sputnik is not the only virophage that's been discovered. There are others. One is called Mavirus or Ma virus. It is a virophage of another virus, a giant virus, that infects a marine organism called Cafeteria renbergensis. It's shown up here. This is a phagotropic flagellate. It's called cafeteria because it eats anything. And it lives in the ocean and feeds on smaller parts, possibly the most abundant eukaryote on the planet. And humans are not, by the way, if you thought so. Uh, so this has a virus that infects it. And then there's a, another virus that requires it as well. There are many large DNA viruses that infect algae. They're called phycodnaviruses. And there are virophages of those. They're called organic lake virophages. They were first discovered in organic lake in Antarctica. Mimi, uh, virophages have also been found in a variety of other environments. 
uh, a salty lagoon, Galapagos Island, uh, even in New Jersey, and in Panama. So they're probably everywhere. They're not in just one particular place. What are they doing? Uh, there is a lot of speculation about their role in the viral ecosystem. They could be gene exchangers. They could facilitate ways of exchanging genes among viruses and among cells. And they may have an interesting impact on ocean ecology. Uh, organic lake uh, doesn't get a lot of sunlight it's down there in Antarctica. And so it has a very limited microbial community. And this depends on um, the kinds of amoeba that um, the kinds of life forms that are infected uh, with these virophages. Now the virophages, if they in fact impact on, uh, if they decrease the uh, yields of larger virus, it could be that they are protecting cells uh, from destruction. So when you have algal blooms in these um, southernmost lakes, the, the lakes fill up with <coughs> material that can be eaten by other life forms like cafeteria. And the, me, the large viruses could be destroying these life forms unless they have a virophage in them. So the virophage could mitigate the cell destruction and that could have an impact on uh, microbial communities in these lakes. So they may have been selected for by their ability to reduce the destruction caused by larger viruses. So this is all speculation, but could be very interesting. All right, so that's all for um, virophages. We'll come back to them briefly when we talk about satellites later. Uh, now I want to uh, address this interesting question of what is the minimum genome size needed to be infectious? Or do you need a genome at all? And that's what we're going to look, uh, look at today. Viroids, satellites, and prions. That's the subject for the rest of today. And these, as we examine these, we're going to answer these questions. They don't fit into the standard taxonomy that we've established for viruses, so we call them, often we call them subviral agents. Uh, viroids, you will see, are major plant pathogens. Satellites, some of them are associated with human disease, but mostly with plants. And prions uh, cause some very serious uh, human and other animal diseases. So we'll talk about these three uh, categories today, starting first with viroids. Now, viroids are very interesting. They consist only of a genome. They don't have a a virion coat surrounding them. So they migrate from host to host as naked nucleic acid. They don't need any receptor to get into cells. So far there are 2,883 different viroids that have been identified and you can find them all at the, there's a database where all of these sequences are kept uh, and these for the most part, uh, represent unique uh, isolates. The first viroid to be identified, 1967, was potato spindle tuber viroid. And this was discovered because of its effect on plants. Now here are some tomato, uh, potato plants here. Maybe these are tomatoes. I guess they're potatoes because that's the name of the, the viroid. But if you plant these plants and then you infect them with different viroids of different pathogenicity or uninfected. You see this is the healthy uninfected plant here on the left. And the most virulent viroid stunts the growth of the plant, as you can see. And then there are intermediate pathogenicity. So these have serious effects uh, on the viability of <coughs> plants. This particular viroid is 350 nucleotide, 59 nucleotides in length. So a lot of these cause plant disease, so they're agriculturally very important. Others don't cause any disease at all. all right, so they are just RNA molecules. Unencapsidated RNA, and they don't code for any protein. It's just a piece of RNA that survived for many, many years without being able to code for protein. The RNA is a circle. They're pretty small, uh, and it's single-stranded. When these get into plants, and we'll talk about, well, they get into plants usually mechanically, uh, by farm equipment or by contamination as a seedling. Uh, they replicate in the plant and produce more of themselves. And we don't actually call them subviral agents anymore. They get a lot of respect. Um, they are now classified into two different families, Popsiviroidae and Avsonviroidae. 
according to where they replicate, either in the nucleus of the plant or the chloroplast. Okay. Just RNA, they don't code for any protein. Some of my favorite viroids, the Kadang Kadang coconut viroid. It causes a disease of coconut palms. You can see this one here, the, the leaves are turning yellow. And that's not good. You can't sell the coconuts that um, <laughs> are made by plants infected with this viroid. Anybody like pina coladas? Because if you do, then this is making you sad. Uh, we have the hop latent viroid, HLVD. It doesn't cause any symptoms in the hop plant, which is good for beer lovers because you can still use it to make beer, but they are there. And then there's the apple scar skin viroid. And you can see what it does to an apple. You may have seen apples like this in the supermarket. Uh, and they're, f they're perfectly healthy to eat. They just look odd. They taste fine, but a lot of people don't want to buy an apple that looks like this. But if you ever see one, uh, it's got a viroid in it. So maybe someday you'll see one and remember that you learned about that in virology. So those are just a couple. There are tons of these different viroids, and they affect many different kinds of uh, plants. So they don't encode proteins, and they don't encode mRNA. You don't need to make an mRNA if you're not going to make a protein, of course. As I said, they're circular RNA molecules. They range in length from 246 to 399 nucleotides. The RNA is very highly base paired. And you'll see a, a picture in a moment. If you look at these in the electron microscope, it looks like they look like rods, not circles, because they're all base paired. And, and many of these are ribozymes. So a ribozyme is an RNA sequence that can cleave RNA, either itself or another RNA. And this is an activity that is essential for the reproduction of these viroids, as you can see. So we can make a very specific distinction about these viroids compared with viruses. So I've told you many times in this course that viruses are, the, are parasites of the translation machinery. So you have, every virus needs to make an mRNA because it can't translate it. It uses the host cell to do that. Well, viroids don't need to use the translation machinery. They don't make proteins. They are instead parasites of the transcription machinery. Their genomes are copied by the host cell uh, RNA polymerase apparatus. Um, they have no enzymes themselves. They don't code for any protein. So they're dependent on the host to replicate them. <coughs> so this is what a potato sp spindle tuber viroid looks like. As I said, it's a circular RNA that's extensively base paired. So in, in the EM, it looks like a rod-shaped structure. It has terminal ends, left and right ends. Uh, it has a central conserved region. There's a variable region here. And then on the left is a region we've labeled pathogenesis. If you make changes there, you affect uh, the pathogenicity of the viroid, the ability of it to cause disease in plants. How do they replicate? Well, they are replicated by the host RNA polymerase 2, the same polymerase that makes mRNAs. So the polymerase will copy the viroid RNA. And as you will see in a moment, it makes concatamers, that is, multiple copies. So if you imagine a circle, if you take an enzyme and make a transcript of the circle, if you keep going around the circles, you make concatamers. That, that is, unit length genomes all linked together. And these are cut into, un into genome length pieces by the ribozyme that is in the, ribos uh, the viroid sequence. Okay, so this was discovered in 18 1981, the fact that RNA could do a reaction by itself without any protein. Probably these are remnants of the RNA world. Yes? What was that word? Transcribe. Thank you. No, it can, it can, in fact, RNA polymerase can copy RNA. Absolutely. Sure. Isn't that right, Dr. Silverstein? Yeah, but if given a viroid RNA, it will copy it. Um, there are other examples as well. Okay, so these have an important enzyme, the, the ribozyme, uh, in them. The, the moral of that is that you never should assume that there aren't exceptions to anything in biology. There always is. So I've told you so far that viruses have genomes that encode proteins and have capsids, and here we have an exception to that. So one group of viroids uh, makes a self-cleaving RNA called the hammerhead ribozyme. It's a well-characterized ribozyme. 
and this cleaves the, the, unit, the concatamers into unit length uh, molecules. Some viroids use host nuclear enzymes to do that, so not every viroid has a hammerhead uh, in its genome. So let's just take a brief look at how these multiply. Here's a plant cell. And this is an example of how those viroids in the Popsiviroidae family multiply. These are uh, multiplying in the nucleus of the plant cell. So the viroid gets into the cell. There are no known insect vectors. It probably, as I said, gets in by mechanical damage or at the, at the level of the seed, these can probably get in. Uh, the circular RNA of the viroid, it's shown here, gets into the nucleus. It's brought in by nuclear import pathways. And there, Paul II copies it. Now, we give polarities to this RNA. We're calling them plus and minus. But it's really not a meaningful polarity because these don't encode proteins. So you shouldn't assume just because we call this a plus that it's an mRNA. So there's another exception. Remember, I said plus RNA is mRNA, but not for these guys. We're just calling it that so we can distinguish between plus and the, and the complement, which is minus. So the Paul II of the plant cell copies this. It makes concatamers. We're just showing two of them here. Multiple genomes linked together. Uh, it then copies it again to make a plus strand concatamer. They get imported into nucleolus. And there, they get chopped up, uh, depending on whether there's a ribozyme in the viroid or if it needs something from the cell, into unit length molecules, which circularize. And they get exported out. And then they move on to the next cell. As you know, there are uh, pathways, there are tunnels from cell to cell uh, through which things can go. And these viroids can then go into the next cell and multiply some more. So that's how these viroids that use the nucleus multiply. As I said, there's the Avsun viroidae that multiply in the chloroplast. Uh, here's a viroid coming into the cell. It's shown here, structure. They all have structure, of course. Uh, it's copied by cell enzymes again. These are just the names of some cell proteins that are involved. You don't need to know anything about that. Uh, they make unit concatamers of the ribozyme again, uh, of the viroid. These are chopped up. Uh, and then they fold, and then they're copied again. So it's a slightly different replication scheme. Uh, but the, the, the main point is that the host cell is replicating them. And the um, concatamers are chopped up either by the ribozyme or by uh, the host cell enzymes. And again, these get exported and go into the next cell. So eventually, they can infect the entire plant. And if it's a virulent viroid, it will cause symptoms, stunting, et cetera, different colors. If not, the plant is not harmed. And who knows what, what the consequence of this is. It might be beneficial. Here's another viroid, peach latent mosaic. Makes me hungry to say this word, peach latent mosaic. Uh, these are larger viroids. They have different kinds of structures from potato st uh, spindle tuber viroid. You can see they're extensively base paired and have a lot of sec RNA secondary structure. What's the origin of things? these things? Where did they come from? Well, we discovered them in the 20th century when they started infecting modern crops. So they've probably been around for a very long time. Uh, but they got transferred at some point from wild plants into our crops. Uh, you know, at the, in the early days of agriculture, um, the wild plants were very close to our crops. And they could easily, agents could easily go between them. And so at some point in the 20th century, these viroids went into our crops. And now we use monoculture for farming in the world. We use genetically identical uh, seeds derived from one origin. Everybody on, if that's planting corn pretty much uses the same stock. It's not a good idea because you end up having one genetic line of, of plant and it can become susceptible. And anyway, those uh, monocultures have, uh, many of them have viroids in them or are susceptible to them. So these are worldwide distributed. And as I said, they're transmitted now by contaminated farm machinery. If you have a, a viroid infection and you get rid of it, it may be that the viroid survives on your tractor. And then next year, when you plant new crops, you plow the soil, you plow your viroid into the soil, and you reinfect your new crops. So that's pretty much how they're transmitted by the farmers themselves. We don't know how they're transmitted in the wild, but it could be that uh, sap-eating animals or insects might be involved. So how do they cause disease if they don't make a protein? What we think is that um, small RNAs derived from the viroid genome are processed by the cell's uh, small RNA processing machinery. So you've heard, and you've heard before, I'm sure, about 
microRNAs and other small RNAs that regulate gene expression. These are processed from precursors and then the small 21 nucleotide RNAs bind targets and regulate their activity. So we think that the viroid RNA is chopped up in the cell by say Dicer or one of these small RNA processing machineries and then some of these silence specific plant genes. So the idea is that the viroid has RNAs which will regulate the expression of plant genes. And so why do we know this? Well, first of all, when you see symptoms in plants, that correlates with the production of these small RNAs. If you mutate them so that they don't produce these small RNAs, it attenuates the disease. And that pathogenesis domain of the viroid that I pointed out earlier, uh, many of these small RNAs map to that region. So this is a hypothesis at the moment, needs more work to prove it, but it makes sense because there's no uh, protein encoded in these. Yeah? What came first, the discovery of viroids and this interaction or the discovery of uh, interfering RNAs and the suppression of gene expression? So this came long before uh, interfering RNAs, uh, the mechanisms. This was the early uh, 1967 and small interfering RNAs are much later. But when the, the RNA, the small RNA story came up, it made sense to explain how these uh, were pathogenesis. Until that time, no one understood how these could cause disease because they didn't have proteins. Until after Yeah, because we didn't know that RNA could, small RNAs could regulate. Yes, sir? The observation of what small RNAs did in terms of changing flat colors and things like that probably predates that. The mechanism was not known. 1967? Yeah. Tulip, tulips and white and like that. Yeah, but we didn't know that they are from small right. RNAs, though. Yeah, sure. So anyway, the small RNA field explained the seems to explain the viroid pathogenesis. Really nice. All right, so that's viroids. They're they're pretty interesting. Um, satellites is our next topic. These are small single-stranded RNAs. They're slightly bigger than viroids, 500 to 2,000 nucleotides in length. They have some genes. These make proteins of some kind, but they lack genes that they need to replicate. So they always need a helper virus. They can't replicate without a helper virus. So they're different from viroids because viroids can't, don't, they don't encode any protein. They don't need a virus to replicate. They need a host cell. Typically, a satellite encodes one or two proteins. And these are usually involved in packaging the satellite RNA. So these satellites form distinct particles, which means they look different from the helper virus. So they're always made in cells infected with another virus, but the particles are different. These genomes encode the structural protein that they need to encapsulate their nucleic acid, so that's not provided by the host, or sometimes part of it is. Um, the replication of the satellite is what the satellite depends on the helper virus for replication proteins, polymerases, or other accessory uh, factors. Okay, so these are distinct agents. They are not derived from the helper, so they are not defective viruses from the helper that have lost some genes. They are unique agents that happen to need a helper in order to replicate. In fact, their genomes don't have any homology with those of the helper virus. All right, so again, they, have, they encode a couple of proteins. They're typically structural proteins, and they depend on a unique helper uh, to replicate. Most of them are associated with plants and plant viruses, and these can cause diseases that you don't see with the helper virus alone. So there are many, many viruses that infect plants, and of course, the first virus discovered, tobacco mosaic virus, is one of those. And there are many, many others that are pathogenic and of agriculture importance. They give specific symptoms. When these satellites infect the plant along with that helper virus, you can get different disease symptoms. All right, so lots of plants have them. There are some satellites in other uh, hosts. They, there is one in bacteria. There is an E. coli bacteriophage, uh, which is actually a satellite that requires another bacteriophage as a helper. And then the adeno-associated viruses are satellites that required uh, adeno or herpes virus helpers. So basically a virophage is a satellite, except it's bigger and it happens to inhibit the production of um, the helper virus. I suspect that sat the virophages encode uh, many more proteins than most of the satellites that we know of, the plant satellites anyway. 
Um, they may be less dependent on the helper, but they are. So the virophages need a helper to replicate, so do these satellites. So I think there's no, there's no virophage. There's just a big satellite that was discovered uh, in cells infected with various big DNA viruses. But the name is there. The press likes it, so I, we're going to probably be stuck with it. It's an interesting idea, I suppose. So here's one uh, human satellite that we'd like to talk about, hepatitis delta virus. Um, it is actually a cross between a viroid and a satellite, as you will see. Its helper is hepatitis B virus. And originally, when it was first discovered, it was believed to make hep B hepatitis more severe. So many people in the world have hep B infection. They can develop hepatitis. And it was thought that if you had hepatitis delta, you got a more severe disease. But it's not clear that this is the case anymore. This is a controversial issue. Nevertheless, we now know that uh, Delta exists. There are about 18 million people globally that are infected uh, with Hep Delta. You have to have Hep B at the same time, otherwise you can't sustain the Delta. That represents about 5% of the 350 million people who are infected uh, with Hepatitis B virus. It was originally picked up in Europe. Uh, its incidence now appears to be declining in Europe and going up elsewhere, in particular the Asia-Pacific region. You can see this map shows you prevalence very high, intermediate, and low uh, according to uh, colors. Again, we don't know if this makes Hep B worse or not. The genome is a single-stranded circular DNA, 1.7 kilobases. It forms a rod-like structure, very much like a, a viroid, but it does encode a protein, as you will see. Um, the RNA also has a ribozyme within it, and this is required for replication, just as in the viroids. That's why I say it's a cross between a viroid and a satellite. It does encode a protein, though. The delta antigen, and this participates in packaging of the delta genome. So that's not something that a viroid uh, does. Of course, the viroids don't encode for any proteins. Uh, the, when the, these are replicating in cells, the HDV and the HBV, the HDV gets encapsulated in the coat of HBV and the delta antigen of uh, delta virus participates in the formation of the coat. I'll show you a photo of that in, in a moment. And the virion is then made up of he hep B antigen and delta antigen. So here's the genome of hepatitis delta. Again, 1.7 KB single-stranded RNA, but it's extensively base paired along its length, so it makes a rod-like structure, very much like a viroid. Uh, there's what's called the genome and the antigenome, so this makes sense now to, to do that. One is the complement of the other. Uh, interesting uh, aspects of this genome, there's an uh, editing site. This is a post-transcriptional editing site where bases are added that are not encoded. And then there's the ribozyme right here in red, the self-cleavage site. The genome encodes one mRNA, called the delta antigen mRNA. You can see here it's a typical cellular mRNA, capped, polyadenylated. Here's the open reading frame for delta antigen. And it makes, it encodes for two forms of delta, a long form and a short form. So here in the, the genome is where the delta antigen is encoded. So these um, hepatitis delta genomes uh, get into cells. The genome uh, is shown here. Uh, and in these, again, these will only replicate or be packaged in cells produce, uh, producing hepatitis B virus. Uh, the virus <coughs> genome gets in. It, it's copied by PAL2, host cell polymerase 2. So again, the RNA polymerase copying an RNA species. And it makes concatomers of the genome. The, that's the green colored molecule here. Uh, some of these are cut by the ribozyme. So the ribozyme is the red sequence. It's a self-cleaving sequence, and that generates uh, some mRNAs that encode delta antigen. But these uh, genomes keep replicating and becoming concatomers, and eventually they are cleaved. You make full-length plus strands, and that's the intermediate replication uh, phase. So you start with the, the negative genome RNA. You make a full-length copy by making concatomers and cutting them, so very much like viroids do. And then these are copied again uh, to form the genome strands. Again, concatomer formation, ribozyme self-cleavage, that's the red sequence here, and eventually you get unit length 
uh, new delta ribozyme, uh, delta virus genome. So you can see you start with that and you end up with it. So it looks a bit complicated, but it's really easy. Concatamers, ribozyme resolves the concatamers, and you just go through an uh, anti genome complement. And in this process, you make uh, delta mRNA from which the protein is made. So in cells infected with hep B, hepatitis B particles are made. You may remember hep B is the one with the gap DNA genome. It also has a reverse transcriptase in its replication cycle. And the hep B virus is uh, the helper for delta. The hep B has a glycoprotein, two kinds of glycoproteins in its envelope, um, the S and the L. And here is a delta virion. So inside is the delta RNA right here all uh, base paired. So it is encapsulated in a membranous coat uh, derived from hep B. It has the glycoproteins from hep B in it. And in addition, you can see large and small delta antigens are here. They form part of the particle. Here they're shown uh, bound to the RNA and allowing the RNA to interact with the interior of the particle. So the, without the hep B virus, the delta would never be packaged. It would never spread from one person to another. Yeah, I guess in theory it could replicate in a cell, but it would never get out of the cell. So this is different from the viroids because the viroids can go from cell to cell by the um, tunnels that go from one cell to another, and then they can mechanically be mechanically transferred from one cell to another, but the delta ribozyme can't do that. So it's evolved to pick up a coat protein from a hepatitis B virus, and that's how it spreads from person to person. So if you, get, if you just took pure delta virus and injected it into yourself, it could replicate, but it would never spread within you, and it would never spread to anyone else, so it would be a dead end. Only if you have hep B and delta will it propagate. Okay, so those are satellites and viroids. Now the last thing we'll talk about today are infectious agents that don't have any genome, and these are the prions, or prions, depending on how you want to call it. It's a made-up word, so can pronounce it the way you want. How do you pronounce it, Dr. Silverstein? I'm afraid to answer. You can say whatever you want. You'd be right. Prions <laughs> or prions. You don't ever say it. That's what you <laughs> think. Okay. Well, that could be an extra credit question. How do you pronounce prions? Okay. Prions are always in the news because they're pretty devastating and they're really unusual, as you will see. So uh, there are a lot of diseases that you'll find, BSE, bovine spongiform encephalitis, or mad cow disease, Creutzfeldt, Jakob, Scrapey, Kuru, chronic wasting disease are all in the news all the time. Uh, the main driver in this story has been Stanley Prusiner, who won a Nobel Prize for this work uh, in 1997. He happened to give a seminar at the medical center in 1997, just a couple of days after they announced his Nobel Prize, so that was pretty neat. He didn't have time to cancel his seminar for being too important. <laughs> so these uh, prions cause diseases known as transmissible spongiform encephalopathies, TSEs. We'll, we'll abbreviate them as TSEs for short. These are infectious agents without genomes. They, the TSEs are neurodegenerative diseases of different kinds of animals. They are uniformly fatal. If you get a TSE, you're going to die. We don't have any way to intervene. And there are thousands of people diagnosed each year globally. Uh, about 1% of these are by infection, and the others we will see have other etiologies. Uh, for example, by the year 22, 120 humans had developed this TSE called Creutzfeldt Jakob from eating meat from animals that had BSE. We'll talk about that in a moment. So you develop, among other things, encephalopathies, which is a disease uh, of the brain. So here are some of the TSE diseases of animals and humans. Just to give you an idea of uh, the species range, BSE is mad cow disease. This is a TSE of cows. There are also TF TSEs of deer and elk and moose. So if you hunt deer, you should really be careful because you could have a TSE. So you shouldn't hunt deer, basically. Um, ungulates, cats can get TSE, both domestic and greater cats, sheep and goats, mink. And humans get uh, these TSEs. They have different names. They have different developments and pathologies. But 
uh, all based on, as you will see, an infectious protein, Creutzfeldt-Jakob, fatal familial insomnia, gerstmann Strassler, Kuru, and variant uh, CJD. So we'll talk about some of these today. So the first TSE recognized was called Scrapey, and it was called Scrapey because it was a disease of sheep, and the farmers noticed they kept rubbing themselves on the fences. They would rub all their fur off or hair, whatever it is, and the guys called them Scrapey. So these animals have motor disturbances. They have uncontrolled trembling. In, Fran in France, it was called tremblant du mouton. And paralysis, weight loss, death within a month or two. And it's been known as a disease in Europe for over 250 years. In some country, it's endemic. In the UK, about 1% of all the sheep in, in the UK developed this disease. Long time it's been around. This is a, this is a sheep with scrapie. Again, they have various neurological manifestations and they have uncontrolled trembling and they rub themselves uh, until their outer covering is gone. Now, early on, sheep farmers became epidemiologists. They found that animals could transmit the disease from one herd to another. They'd give their neighbor farmer a sheep and it turned out they'd have infection, had scrapie, and it would transmit it to the other herd. So it was early on concluded that it was some kind of an infectious agent, but what kind wasn't known. In 1939, it was demonstrated that you could make an extract of a sheep brain, of a, from a sheep with scrapie, pass it through a filter, and then take the filtrate and infect new sheep, and they would develop disease. So this sounded like a virus, right? It was a very small agent. It went through a 0.2 micron filter. But when people started working on these, they found out they were very resistant to ultraviolet light, to ionizing radiation, and to formaldehyde. These are all things which knock out virus infectivity. So early on, a number of individuals, in particular Stan Prusiner, said this is something really different because it's got these very resistance to these uh, different kinds of treatments. So early on, the hypothesis arose by Prusner and a few others that these agents, again, the scrapey agent, did not have nucleic acid and th therefore was atypical. Many people didn't believe him. They just said, you can't find the nucleic acid. It must be there. Uh, but he pursued this, and, and it is true. These don't have nucleic acids, although you will find today people who still argue that buried somewhere in these agents, and we'll see what they are in a moment, there is nucleic acid, but I, I don't think that's the case. These are clearly protein-only agents. So here is a graph of uh, the resistance of various infectious agents to ionizing radiation. So here are two curves for DNA viruses and uh, RNA viruses. So you have less radiation and more. And as you increase the amount of radiation, this is the amount of radiation that you need to destroy, say, half of the infectivity of each agent. So uh, the very uh, big DNA viruses are, are up here, uh, high molecular weight. They are big targets for ionizing radiation. And then as the genome gets smaller, whether it be DNA or RNA, you need more and more radiation to inactivate it because it's a smaller target. It's a very simple, straightforward relationship. The bigger the target, the bigger the molecular weight of the nucleic acid, the less radiation you need, UV or ionizing radiation, to knock out infectivity. Look at where scrapie fell. All the way at the right end, the highest amount of radiation was needed to knock out its infectivity. So this is one of the reasons why initially it was thought to be very unusual. Plus, it couldn't be inactivated by typical inactivation treatments. Now, in the brain of these animals, um, if you look at them uh, in sections under the microscope, you can see that it's full of, it looks spongy, and that's why these are called the spongiform encephalopathies. The brain matter is full of holes, and as I said, there are all sorts of dysfunctions uh, in the infected animal, depending on where in the brain this, this protein is. And that's why we have so many different diseases. We have five different ones in humans. They have characteristic symptoms and, and pathology. So here's a section of sheep brain. Uh, showing this spongiform appearance. So this is not normal. This is abnormal. You're not supposed to have all of these um, openings in the brain matter, and that's the spongiform appearance caused by the proliferation of the protein in the brains. 
So um, the TSEs, the spongiform encephalopathies, transmissible ones, they have very similar abnormalities. When you look at sections under the microscope, you have uh, defects in the membranes, vacuolization, loss of neurons in particular, and that gives you some of the symptoms. Spongy form appearance, which I just showed you, and um, accumulation of various proteins in clumps. Uh, and in particular, uh, amyloidosis, that is the accumulation of fibrils of amyloid precursor protein. And they make very uh, characteristic clumps, which we'll see in a moment. So as I said, initially the scrapie agent was detected in brain extracts from sheep. And you would take a, a scrapie brain and homogenize it and then inject it into another animal, initially sheep, uh, and they would develop disease, develop all sorts of symptoms, ataxia, dementia, and death. And these were very long experiments. So in a sheep, it can take one or two years for the uh, infection to take on. So eventually, investigators found other animals where the incubation period was much shorter. Uh, we're not really sure how the, uh, the agent gets to the CNS. It may be brought there by immune cells. Uh, but eventually, from peripheral sites, it gets to the CNS. And as I said, you have specific signs in the CNS, which we have talked about. Very interestingly, you don't have an antibody response against this protein. So if you injected a sheep with an extract uh, of the brain from another sheep, uh, you wouldn't have any antibody, no inflammation, no cellular response against the scrapie agent because it's, it's a self-protein. So um, there's no way to get rid of it, really. So you can't detect any of these infections until you have symptoms. So you have the various neurological symptoms that develop very late in infection. Uh, and at that point, then you can diagnose it but by pathology. But before then, we don't have a lab test to, determining, to determine early on who's at risk or who might be at an early stage of infection. It's only when you develop symptoms that you can go and have a diagnosis made. I remember um, many, many years ago, the director of the New York City Ballet, George Balanchine, all of a sudden started developing these motor deficiencies. He'd be walking down a hall and he would bump into the, to the walls. And of course, this is a guy who uh, was a terrific dancer. But, and it turned out that he had Creutzfeldt-Jakob and he ended up dying of it. But only until he developed symptoms uh, did we know what he had. So it's untreatable and invariably fatal. So this is why, in particular, it's picked up by the press, because the fatal disease is always fascinating. So the agent is a prion. Uh, Stanley Prusiner coined this name. It means proteinaceous infectious particles, prions. In fact, long before Prusiner called them prions in 1967, an investigator named Griffith, he thought they were proteins only, uh, based on a variety of experiments. And Prusiner actually identified the protein in the brain. He purified it from the brain by biochemical approaches and showed that the purified protein, when injected into a new animal, would transmit the disease. So he proved that this protein was the etiologic agent. That's what he called the prion. He then sequenced the prion protein and cloned the gene that encodes it. So we all have a gene that encodes this protein. It's called the PRNP gene, the prion protein gene. And this is absolutely essential for TSEs. If you don't have this uh, gene, you're not going to develop TSEs. But we all have it. As far as I know, there aren't any people who lack this gene. You can make mice that lack it, and they don't get prion disease. But as far as I know, humans don't, don't have, don't miss, do not lack the gene. So the current view of what a prion is, remember now a prion is a specific protein. It is the agent of these transmissible encephalopathies. Um, we have a normal host protein called PRPC, prion protein cellular form. We all have this. It's normal. It has a function in the cell, in, in particular in the CNS. And at some point, it becomes conformationally altered. And then it becomes pathogenic. So it's a normal protein found on the outer surface of neurons. The, the abnormal conformer, let's call it, when you put that into another animal, it causes the conversion of the normal protein, PRPC, into the pathogenic form. And that is called PRPSC 
for Scrapey, the first TSC that was studied. So we all have PRPC. If somehow you get PRPSC from someone with a TSC, that PRPSC will convert your endogenous PRPC into PRPSC and you will develop a, a TSC. That's how it works. And this, um, this altered protein, this PRPSC accumulates in your brain. It forms various inclusions. It causes the vacuolization that I showed you before. And it, and it accumulates particularly in plaques and amyloid fibrils. And that's shown here. So this is a section of an animal with a TSE, it's stained with, it's a brain section, it's stained with an antibody against the prion protein. And you can see the prion forms is part of these amyloid plaques. These are abnormal, you're not supposed to have these. These are accumulations of fibrillar forms of amyloid and other proteins and in that is the prion. So the prion is probably triggering the formation of these plaques, which is one of the reasons why you have uh, altered neurological function. So early on it was found that the prion protein, the normal prion protein, PRPC, which is diagrammed here, we have some structure of this protein now. You can see we have repeats, we have alpha helices. If you treat this protein with proteinase K, it's completely digested. So this is your normal uh, prion protein, the PRPC. If you take the PRPSC form, the abnormal, the pathogenic form of this protein, if you digest that with proteinase K, it is only partially digested. The N-terminus is removed. The rest of the protein is resistant to proteinase K. And that is because it has undergone a conformational change to hide the proteinase K digestion sites and in general make it resistant to cleavage. So that's one of the reasons why we call this a conformational change in the protein. You have the native or the normal PRPC, it's folded in a specific way, it's sensitive to proteinase K, and then when it becomes pathogenic, when it's converted to this SC form by another SC prion, uh, then it, it acquires a lot of beta sheets in its structure and becomes resistant to proteinase K. So this is now the diagnostic for uh, the presence of PRPSC, that resistance to uh, proteinase K. Now, a couple of other pieces of information for you. First, that if you delete the PRNP gene in mice, you can do that quite readily. You can make knockout <coughs> mice. Uh, these mice cannot be infected with mouse uh, PRPSC. So you can infect mice with pathogenic prions. They will develop scrapie. Uh, if those mice happen to have a knockout of PRP, PRNP, they will never develop disease. And if you think about it, that makes sense because you need your gene to make PRPC, which will then be converted to PRPSC and cause the disease. So that shows that the gene is essential. You can give these mice tons and tons of PRPSC. They will never develop disease because it causes disease by converting your own protein to the SC form. Now, you can acquire uh, PRPSC, what's called infection. Um, you can eat it, you can, uh, you can get it by medical procedures, um, corneal transplants, certain blood products have been known to transmit PRPSC, so this is what we call infection. Uh, or you can, be, you can develop a mutation spontaneously in your PRNP gene, which causes the protein to misfold and become PRPSC, and then as soon as you have some of that, it will keep on causing other proteins to misfold as well. Okay, so you can be infected or you can have genetic predispositions. And here are two ideas about how this refolding or this transmittal is working. In other words, for how does PRPSC change PRPC into PRPSC? I've already told you that it involves a conformational change in the protein. Here's the refolding model which says that the two conformations of the protein, the C and the SC conformation, never interchange in, in a cell. One, for example, the C never becomes spontaneously SC or vice versa. However, if uh, you acquire some um, PRPSC, it will then convert the cellular form into the pathogenic form. 
Okay, so normally you need SC to trigger this process. Then there's the seeding model, which says there's a very low rate of conversion of the cellular form to the abnormal form, extremely low. But under certain circumstances, you can start uh, accumulating more uh, of the pathogenic form. And then when you reach a certain level, uh, this then can trigger the conversion of, of uh, the cellular forms as well. These are just two hypothetical models for how this is working. We're not really sure yet. So let's talk a little bit about human TSEs. There's some very interesting stories here. The first one in humans. Remember, Scrapey was the first animal TSE in people. Uh, the first human TSE was Kuril, which was a fatal disease in, found in a very specific uh, set of people in New Guinea with a 30-year incubation period. And uh, virologist Carlton Gaidusek went there to study this disease because he thought it might be a, a viral disease. And he found that it spread mainly among women and children because when someone died they would eat the brain of that person. The brain was fed to only women and children and not men. So the women and children got the disease because these people died of a TSE. And the brain is full of the scrapey protein and they would eat it and then they would develop 30 years later a TSE. So he told that he studied this very carefully. He did the epidemiology. He said you have to stop this and eventually they did and now Kuro is gone uh, from this, uh, these peoples in New Guinea. So human TSEs can be infectious or transmissible like Kuro. You eat uh, contaminated material, a brain, or you can eat contaminated meat, you can get it. It can be spread by transplantations of various parts, corneas, hormones, transfusions. If people have a TSE and it's very early on in the incubation, you don't have any symptoms, then you can easily transmit it. We have no way of picking it up. Um, you can eat contaminated cow meat, and that's what BSE is. Uh, so BSE is a disease of cows. It, the cows get this TSE because they are fed ground up animals, all mixed together of all sorts, cows, pigs, sheep. They're all put in a vat and ground up and they're fed to the cows because it makes the cows grow faster when you give them meat as opposed to grass. <coughs> Uh, and among those dead animals that are fed to the cows are some with a TSE. So the, the cows get a TSE, they get BSE. And then you eat the cow meat and you get Creutzfeldt, variant Creutzfeldt Jakob. It's a little bit like Yak CJ, but it's different enough to be called variant. And that's from eating beef. So these are all ways that you can get it in an infectious way. So this um, whole BSE episode is, a way, is really a kind of forced cannibalism spreading the disease. So as I said, uh, we, we had this practice of feeding processed animal byproducts to cattle as protein supplements. And that caused the disease to be transmitted to cows because among the processed carcasses were those with TSEs. Uh, when this was discovered, we stopped feeding the cows this material and that stopped the outbreak of mad, mad cow disease. Um, but eventually, this eventually made its way into the human food chain and a number of people developed variant Creutzfeldt Jakob from eating BSC beef. So now we have to be very careful about the food supply. And you'll see now and then a, a cow in the US or a cow in, in, in some country is found to have TSE. And then you have to really watch the food chain very carefully. Because again, you don't know it until the animals develop neurological symptoms. Uh, this is the BSE CJ outbreak in the UK. Uh, so here in 1987, um, they put a ban on the, the feeding animals meat and bone meal because at that point it had already been suspected that this was a problem. But it takes a long time to incubate these diseases. So you can see there was a peak a number of years later in cows. So this is BSE in cows. Uh, eventually it went down uh, to zero. And then the outbreak in humans, variant CJ, went up because, again, there's a long incubation period. So we ate the cows and we got... Uh, CJ. So right now we're, we're back down to zero, but it just shows that this is a big problem. There is another kind called sporadic uh, Creutzfeldt-Jakob, about less than a million people globally. This usually happens at an old age. It has no warning, no epidemiological indications. You have normal genes, uh, and all of a sudden you develop this disease, and this is what George Balanchine developed. He had no risk factors for transplant or eating contaminated meat. And you can spread it to others if you give them your contaminated material. And we don't know why this happens. It's some sporadic aspect. Maybe there's a misfolding of a 
normal protein spontaneously, and that then triggers misfolding of others. And that may have been how it got established, say, in New Guinea. So it's an isolated tribe. Someone develops sporadic Kreuzfeld Jakob, he dies, they feed the brain to others. That in introduces the uh, disease into the tribe. There is familial forms. There are familial forms. These are inherited diseases with a genetic basis. They're associated with mutations in the gene. So you have a mutation in your prion gene that predisposes the prion to misfolding. And you can develop a TSE in your offspring. If they get the gene, uh, they can because it's an autosomal dominant uh, mutation. And again, you can transmit this to others. So let's say you have a familiar predisposition to CJ. You are relatively young, but you have mutant or misfolded prions already in you. You donate some blood or some blood product or even a cornea. You die and you donate a cornea. That can transmit the infection to someone else because, again, you don't have symptoms. Of course, if you have symptoms, you can't uh, donate anything, but that rarely happens. So we have three kinds of TSEs, infectious, familial, and sporadic that we've talked about. And all of these are basically the same disease. They can be transmitted to animals, uh, and uh, they can, they're caused by the same kind of transformation, a cellular prion, a normal cellular prion to PRP uh, SC. Again, you start with a normal prion or prion gene protein, and then um, if you add the SC, the pathogenic protein to it, it will convert it, so this is the infectious form. You somehow get the pathogenic protein. Uh, you can have a genetic predisposition, so there's a mutation that predisposes you to misfolded protein. And spontaneous misfolding, these random occurrences we don't know the origin of, they have no genetic uh, determinant, but that's sporadic. So those are the three different kinds. There is a species barrier, so you can't just take one, always one species of prion and put it in another and transmit disease. Sometimes it does, but not always. Sometimes putting a, a protein into a different species is inefficient. I'm talking about the SC protein now. And so, for example, um, you can't give hamster prion to mice and effectively induce disease. But if you, uh, and in, in the same way, if you um, take cow prions, so you have a cow with TSE, you, you purify the pathogenic protein from the cow. If you put that into mice, it doesn't cause disease in the mice. But if you give the mouse the cow prion gene, then they will develop scraping. So you have to have an, a, a gene related to the prion protein from the host you're trying to transmit the infection. And that barrier to interspecies transmission is in the sequence of the prion protein, as shown by this transgenic experiment. Now, you may be asking, why do humans get prion diseases from cow, right? It's different species. Well, uh, some, of the some of the species transmittals or are not absolute. <clears throat> so apparently going from cows to human is okay, but going from cows to mice uh, is not, and among other animals is not as good either. But there is a species barrier. Uh, the cow scrapie has a broad host range. As I said, that's why it can infect us. So it can also infect many other animals. Uh, so somehow um, the primary sequence is overridden. And that's why BSC is worrisome, because the cow prion can infect uh, many other animal species. Not mice, but humans, sheep, goats, pigs, whoever you feed um, the, a, a dead cow to basically can get BSC from that. Interestingly, there are also strains of scrapey proteins, prion proteins, the pathogenic forms. Uh, they have different incubation times, brain pathology, glycosylation, and these presumably repre represent different conformations of the protein. Remember, they're all made from one gene that is the same pretty much unless it has a one or two amino acid change that predisposes it to misfolding. Uh, but you can make a scrapey in many different ways, uh, you can make many different kinds of scrapey proteins from the same gene. So these kinds of differences are conformational. And there's even evolution of these prion differences, Darwinian evolution. So if you, you can infect cells in culture with prion proteins. You can take a cell culture of the right cells, 
you put the, prion, the pathogenic prion protein in them, it will get in and it will multiply in cells and it will convert the cellular prion protein into the scrapie form very efficiently. And what you can do is make cell culture adapted prions and they are different from the prions you get right out of uh, the animal. Um, and you can in fact use a drug uh, called swainosine to inhibit the multiplication of prions, you will get resistant prions emerging, just like you get resistant viruses to an antiviral drug. So you can make, you can select for mutants resistant to a drug, even though there's no nucleic acid involved here, it's just a protein. We're putting a protein in a cell and we use a drug to inhibit its conversion of the cellular form and the, that protein can evolve to be resistant. And that resistance is not genetically based, it is structurally based. So it's very unusual. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, some wildlife get TSE, deer, elk, and moose. And here is the range so far of these animals. This, the yellow are areas with infected populations, Canada, US, all over the US. Um, and also the gray is captive. Captive animals of these sorts have CJ, so um, TSEs. So again, you go to this website here, they will tell you if you hunt deer, um, first of all, if it's, if it's behaving strangely, if it looks like it has neurological symptoms, don't touch it. And if it looks healthy, it could still have an infection. They say keep away from the spinal column. Don't, don't cut out the spinal cord because that's where the pathogenic prions are going to be. So there hasn't been any uh, example yet of a deer prion disease going into a human, but who knows, the incubation period is a long time and we can't do the experiment to find out. So that's why hunters have to be really careful. So this um, slide shows you how we think these emerged. So the blue is a naturally occurring TSC and the red is an artificially occurring one. So probably Scrapie existed for years and years in sheep and goats and that was probably introduced to cows in the food chain, grinding up dead sheep and goats, feeding it to cows. That caused BSE uh, in cows which spread to other cattle, other animals as well, could probably get it from cows and domestic feeding cow material to domestic cats for example probably spread it to cats. It spread to humans by eating cow meat and then the people who got it from cows could spread it to other humans by donating body parts, blood, et cetera, as we've talked about. Um, it's also likely that the, um, so the, the deer and elk chronic wasting disease could also be a spontaneous uh, TSE just like scrapie on its own or could have derived from scrapie, we don't actually know. Some, there's evidence that the mink scrapie, uh, the mink TSEs came from uh, sheep and goats as well. And finally, as I told you, there are naturally occurring sporadic Creutzfeldt Jakob. These are people who just come down with the disease without getting infected. They just spontaneously misfold the protein or they have a genetic disposition and they can infect other people as well. That's why this is the naturally occurring disease and this is the artificially one. So these are all the different ways we think that uh, these diseases have spread. Now, it turns out that other organisms, particularly fungi, have prions also. And they are not pathogenic. It's only the prions in mammals that turn out to be pathogenic. I'm sorry, before I tell you about that, one last word on prions in the food supply. As I said earlier, we're always checking to make sure that we don't have uh, prion-containing cattle in the food supply, uh, w which is difficult to do. We're trying to develop uh, diagnostic tests. They're not great. We're also looking for drugs that will inhibit the formation of these so someday we can treat people who, who have these diseases because as I said now they're all fatal. Um, Saccharomyces and other fungi have prions. They don't cause disease but they respond to the environment. They, they create protein-based molecular memories and we think that they allow the yeast to adapt to different environments. So if a nutrient is missing uh, a protein can change conformation and do something else typically to produce uh, for the yeast what's missing. All right, so these are proteins that can change their function according to the environment in these yeasts. So the prion, the basis for this of course is the PRPC in people which changes its conformation 
uh, and can do different things as a PRPSC, it can cause disease. But in the yeast and the other fungi, it has a totally different function. And here's just a list of some of these proteins. So we have the PRP in mammals, which is the only pathogenic one. And then we have all these other genes in various fungi that encode proteins that are essential for the yeast, but they, when altered, so there's a normal state and there's a prion state, it gives the yeast some kind of benefit. So for example, normally the CYC8 gene encodes a transcriptional repressor. When it goes into the prion state, it can help the yeast use a different source of carbon. So these are really amazing proteins. They can flip their function in a non-genetic manner and allow uh, yeasts to do other things when conditions so, so dictate. So prions are bad in people, but in other organisms, they are uh, quite good.